Good morning and welcome to worship at the First Baptist Church of Ypsilanti. Uh, the doors behind me are waiting to be reopened, but it's going to be a while before that happens. So in the meantime, we will continue together in spirit and worship in this online setting. I know you're ready <clears throat> to enter them, but we will be patient in this time as the Lord grows us and matures us in our faith. I want to also welcome those who are worshiping with us online from distant places. Uh, you are welcome to this worship service as well. May God bless us all here, there, and everywhere as we gather in His Spirit. And now for our call to worship, Mary Mosher will read Psalm 100. Today's scripture reading is Psalm 100, and I will be reading from the Revised Standard Version. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Good morning, everyone. Let's worship together. Here in your life we find what makes us come alive, a sacrifice of praise. A city on a hill, surrender to your will, your glory on display. Your glory on display.
Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 49. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. As we come now to a time of prayer, you can see the sanctuary is not well lit. The sanctuary is not lit at all, except by the natural light of the sun on a cloudy day, because there is no power in the building. I won't say there's no power in the church, because you and I are the church, and we of course have the presence of God and the Holy Spirit with us to give us power. So you may have to squint a little bit more. There's nothing wrong with your computer, so you don't need to try to add brightness to it. I would also add that they're doing construction on West Cross Street, or Cross Road, and you can enter the church only from the east and by coming in the exit to get to the parking lot. So with these thoughts in mind, let us pray. Oh Lord, as we come to you in prayer, on this Memorial Day weekend. We do want to remember the day and the weekend. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that we in the church share liberties through your mercy and through the sacrifice of men and women who have taken up arms to protect and to defend our freedoms. So over this Memorial Day weekend, Lord, help us to find a moment to reflect on the meaning of sacrifice, knowing that people do not sacrifice unless it is for something or someone whom they love. To remember those who have given the last full measure and those who serve now and those who have served. Lord, you are our God. In you, we live and move and have our being. In your light, we find our light. And in your love, we find healing and hope. Draw near to us and grant to us a fresh vision of your way forward through this difficult and unusual time. Lord, increase our faith and fill our days with an awesome, awesomeness and awareness of your presence here with each of us and on the journey that we share in Christ. As we gather, we are mindful of those whose lives have been disrupted by the flooding in Midland. We pray for your mercy and compassion to be with them, to minister and care for their needs. We ask, Lord, your life-giving and healing Holy Spirit May attend to the needs of the people who are hurting in one way or another. May your spirit of wisdom fill the thoughts of our leaders at all levels of government. May the abundance of your love comfort the anxious and the lonely. And may the power of your spirit strengthen the hearts of those who feel faint and weak. We thank you, Lord, as we gather. For these who are worshiping with us, we pray and ask for your blessings upon this time together for the strengthening of our faith, our hope, and our love through Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. I want to thank Roger and Judy for the reading of this passage in Luke. You may recall uh, verse 49, but if you don't, I'll help you with it. 
And now, and, and see, I am sending you what my father promised. So stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Now, this passage in Luke is the third resurrection appearance of Jesus to the disciples in Luke, and it serves as a bridge over to the first chapter of the book of Acts. The author of Luke's gospel is also the author of Acts. And in the book of Acts, which we will be getting into next Sunday in chapter 2 on Pentecost, the book of Acts reveals in chapter 2 the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the followers of Jesus and empowering these followers to become the church. And then the book begins to describe the spread of the gospel of the early church in Jerusalem and then to Judea and Samaria and then to the outermost parts of the world. Jesus tells the disciples to wait in the city until you have received power from on high. I believe that Jesus knew that the followers did not have within themselves the power to spread the gospel, to meet the challenges they would confront. They would require a power they could not muster, they could not create, they could not generate themselves. In other words, the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the church is a constant reminder of our need to depend upon God for our ministry. They found that need in their life, we find that need in our life. And I want to suggest that the power of the Holy Spirit who comes to the disciples empowers them and in like manner empowers you and I in three ways. First, the Holy Spirit prompts us. The Holy Spirit prompts us, prompts us to walk in the light as Jesus himself is in the light, to more faithfully follow the pattern of Jesus' life, the teachings of Jesus, his obedience. We can, you and I in our journey can become so easily distracted we can lose our focus by our frustration of the circumstances that we face, by our impatience at and with life, the promotion that we did not receive, the grades that we failed to obtain, the job which, from which we are um, unemployed right now, the friends who have let us down, and the invasion of a virus that you and I cannot control. The Holy Spirit prompts us in these moments to turn our attention to God and to depend on Him. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so as you and I can be distracted from the light by the allure of the seduction of lesser lights, lights that seem to hold promise, but that are themselves empty of meaning. There are the lights uh, are the allure in our society, in particular, of sensuality, of gambling, of thrill-seeking and risk-taking, of drugs, and power, and materialism, of me versus them. This is really where the adversary wants us, walking on these paths, walking in these lesser lights. C.S. Lewis has written a book titled The Screwtape Letters, and perhaps you're familiar with it. The book is his rendering of a series of letters from a minion of the devil named Screwtape, who was training a junior devil named Wormwood. And the training is on how to frustrate the lives of humans so they don't connect to God, on how to prevent humans from connecting with God and walking in the true light. In one letter, Screwtape advises Wormwood to keep the human in the false light of life. Keep him in the bright neon light of the street, of the nightlife, of the bright and gaudy and glittering light that will attract the eyes, that will feed the senses, but that will not inform the heart. Don't let him enter the natural light of the sun because once he is in that light, he will not want to be in the neon light anymore. Well, it is the Holy Spirit who points out to us when we are walking in these lesser lights, when our attitudes need to be re-examined, our behavior needs to make 
those kinds of adjustments that we need to make. The Holy Spirit is the one who calls us to Jesus and who prompts us to direct our steps that we walk in the light as he himself is in the light. The Holy Spirit prompts us to keep the main thing the main thing. Secondly, after prompting us, the Holy Spirit teaches us to remember everything that Jesus himself has taught us. In John 14, verse 25, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, in John 14, which falls within the chapters 13 through 17, this whole block of teaching in John's Gospel is a long discourse by Jesus in which he is preparing his followers for the time when he is not physically with them in the flesh. He will have been crucified, he will have been resurrected, he will have ascended to the Father. To whom then will they turn? And Jesus is saying, yes, there will be my presence with you in the form and the person of the Holy Spirit. And so in preparing his followers for the time when he is not with them in the flesh, he now is teaching them that they will not be left alone. They will have guidance. The Holy Spirit will guide them in the work of Jesus. In this process, we find as we seek to be faithful to Jesus, to follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit, how important the scriptures are for our Christian life. They are essential. The Bible is the guide for faith and practice in living as Jesus follows. The Bible is, in essence, the Word of God, and that Word is a witness to God and to God's will and to God's way. Some people struggle, and I can understand this. Reading a book that was written over a period of 3,000 years by multiple writers, the most recent book is 1,800 years ago, and a book that presents some challenges to us, written in a culture where men wore robes and sandals and rode camels. However, we find that there are plenty of helps available to us, and we should not let any initial frustration with Scripture keep us from plunging into it, because there are books, the Gospel of John, the book of Psalms, that are readily accessible to us and translate very immediately into our world. The Bible, from the Sermon on the Mount to Jesus' last words on the cross, from healing the leper and associating with tax collectors, in the Gospels, we see Jesus teaching and modeling the life that God calls us to live. Matthew 17, oh, I'm sorry, Matthew 7, 13 through 14, I want to read for your hearing. It says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. Now, I have made it a practice in my devotional time to read a chapter out of the Gospels every day, among other things, along with prayer. And over 40 years of reading the scripture, I have read these same passages over that 40 year period, I don't know how many times. And yet what I find so powerful about the scripture is that I can derive new meaning from the same passage that I have read yearly or even monthly for 40 years because my, while the Word is constant, my life situation has changed. And the Scriptures speak to me now in a new way, not because the Scriptures have changed, but because I have changed. And so when I looked at this passage, I heard a pastor talk about the narrow way and the broad way, and he had a really wonderful summation of his interpretation of this passage, which is for us as Christians to be narrow in our devotion to God, but broad in our love for others. That meant really a lot to me in that moment when I heard it. It's a new way of looking at the passage, a new way of hearing Jesus, that this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Trust God to make the passages relevant to you 
so that what the Holy Spirit teaches us in bringing to our remembrance what Jesus has said and taught us, we can more easily connect with that teaching. The Holy Spirit prompts us, the Holy Spirit teaches or brings to our remembrance, and then finally, the Holy Spirit brings the power of God to live faithfully. It is in Christ, in, in Christ, we do not, as Christians, have to allow the circumstances of life to define us. Now, I learned this very powerfully when I was doing a chaplaincy residence in Madison, Wisconsin. I had taken a year out of ministry after 10 years, and I felt it was time to spend a more intensive continuing education experience. So I didn't want to go get an, a degree, read, read books and write papers. So I wanted the clinical experience of being in the hospital and learning about myself in that context. And so I took this year out of ministry and did this residency at a hospital in Madison, Wisconsin. And one of the floors that I covered for that whole year uh, was the oncology floor. Most of the people who were on the oncology floor at that time in one section of that floor were in bad shape. Most, most of them were at the end stages of their disease. What I learned in an amazing way is that some folks would allow themselves to become victims of their illness. Others chose not to allow the cancer to victimize them. Some folks allowed their circumstances to define them. Others chose not to allow their circumstances to define them. Um, what I observed in watching this really wonderful woman, she was a, an older lady, a, a Methodist, and had been in church all of her life. She was a retired school teacher, and she was at the end stages of her disease. And in that process, she drew very deeply on her faith. She exuded a peace that was really hard to explain. Well, you couldn't explain it. You could only experience it. She had a calm spirit that spoke to the strength of her character. She felt the presence of the Lord walking with her. And this awareness was brought to her in conversation by the Holy Spirit. She was truly her weak, frail body, truly clothed with power from on high. What it tells me is, it reminds me of the cliche saying, that we need to let go and let God. And when we let go and let God, when we let go and rely and depend on God, we can find the inner strength within to carry on. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 uh, is writing about having a thorn in the flesh, a chronic hurtful um, thing for him. And the Lord says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul writes, I will all the more gladly boast of my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, God is more present. Philippians 4.11, he writes again. So this is a power thought in the New Testament. Not that I complain of one, for I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and want. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You and I in this period, like the disciples, are waiting in anticipation of the day when we might return to a more normal life. But as we do that, we return to a more normal life, being deepened and matured in our faith, drawing more and more from the Holy Spirit to rely and to depend on God. God is maturing us through this moment. And we may feel that we don't have control of the situation, and in many ways we do not, but God does have control and is in charge. Power comes from the Holy Spirit. So the role of the Holy Spirit is to bring to our remembrance all that Jesus has taught us, to empower us to live as Christian people. 
to lead us in the process whereby our lives are conformed more and more to the life of Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we do indeed thank you for the powerful work of your Spirit in our lives. Help us to have an open mind and a willing heart to follow where you lead. Through Christ our Lord, in whose name I pray. Amen. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at
to keep us and to hold us in the spirit of his love, his mercy, and his compassion. We lift this in Jesus' name. Amen. American Baptist Churches of Michigan, Brian Johnson here, and uh, I'm excited to be able to be a part of your worship service uh, on this Sunday morning. Who would have thought that a few weeks ago when I began this position that uh, we would be where we are today? I had high hopes of being able to visit so many of our churches and getting to know you and build relationships with you. And uh, like you, I'm frustrated that that cannot happen right now. But I didn't want to miss out on an opportunity to just say hi and send my greetings to you and, and just remind you that we are going to get through this. We will get on the other side of this. We will be embracing a new normal. Now, a new normal doesn't mean that we're no longer going to have uh, worship services together. It simply means that the impact of what has happened is going to follow us through. And some of the things that we are having to do right now, we'll continue to do in the future, like utilizing technology and other online collaborative uh, features that allow us to build relationships, foster community with people inside the church, and also create a pathway for people who are not yet a part of our church. Like many of you, uh, I too am wondering, so so when can we uh, start having worship services again? And Unfortunately, I can't give you that answer. One of the beautiful things about being a Baptist is that we believe that each person and each church has the ability to discern the will of God for themselves. In other words, you know what's better for you more than I know what's better for you or some other church out there. And, and whereas a church in the UP may look at opening up their services a lot sooner than a church in Detroit does, it also realizes the fact that each of us have a unique set of circumstances and a unique context. Like you, I too am weary and tired from uh, all of this. I long to be able to go to a restaurant or go to a grocery store and not have to wear a mask or worry about this and that. Um, I wanted to share with you a very familiar passage, but one that I hope that might encourage you today. Uh, the prophet Isaiah reads in uh, Isaiah 43, verse 19, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. The wild an animals honor me, the jackals and owls, because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen. You know, no matter where you are or what you're going through individually or as a church, uh, we feel like it's a bit of a desert, a bit of a wasteland that we're going through, a wilderness experience. But we have the assurance in God's word that God is with us and God is providing for us in the midst of everything that we are going through. Our God will be found faithful on the other side of this. There will be no one who will stand before him one day uh, in heaven and, and have a clear picture of everything that's happened and, and be able to wag their finger at him and say, you've been unjust, you did things wrong, you messed up, or anything like that. No, when we stand before the Lord and we see in a way that we haven't been able to see, we will be even more convinced that our God is faithful. The challenge and the opportunity for you and for me in moments like this is looking for the handiwork of God, looking for his faithfulness in this moment. Well, um, I can't wait to be able to be with you in person to be able to encourage you and your church to be able to be everything that God has uh, called you to be. Thank you for your partnership with American Baptist Churches of Michigan. Thank you for giving to United Mission, which helps underwrite the work that we do. And I believe we are better together and that we are going to see a tremendous outpouring of God's Spirit on churches who are willing to embrace where we are instead of fight where we are and step into this new season of ministry, utilizing the tools and the technologies and the opportunities that are available to us where we can make a difference for Jesus Christ. God bless you this day, and I can't wait to see you soon.